And you know, that really is where we are today. As we continue our journey through Mark's gospel, we are in chapter 7. And, um, and as we go into chapter 7, as many of your Bibles may, may read, there is a, a title here as we begin chapter 7, which is um, Traditions and Commandments. And you'll see that I've titled the message today um, really a question along those same lines. Truth or tradition? Where do you stand on that? Where do you place your value? What is most important? And do you realize the, the, uh, where, where your loyalties may lie as you evaluate your circumstances? Do you put much of your stock into tradition, not realizing that it may not necessarily be the truth? Or do you put it into the truth, which is the commandment of God? And so we want to really understand what constitutes today genuine worship. What is not hypocrisy? And this is really the lesson of Jesus today. Now, as we walk through this passage, verses 1 through 13, you may have heard, and maybe you counted, one word appears six times in this passage, and it's the word tradition. Now, I've alluded to this movie that I've watched and the play that I've attended on more than one occasion in New York City called Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, this, this, this program appeals to me partly because uh, I love history. I've been a teacher of history for 28 years, I think it is now. And, um, and this story is set in 19th century Russia. And in 19th century Russia, there are a lot of changes that are coming to this society. And the Jewish people, once again, are caught in the midst of all of this sweeping change. Now, the main character in this story is a, a father and husband named Tevye. And uh, the opening, this is a musical, and the opening song is titled, Tradition. And, um, and as Tevye is walking along this pathway, he's... He's talking about tradition. And he went something like this. We have traditions for everything. What to eat, how to work, how to dress. And we always wear a little prayer shawl. This shows our constant devotion to God. You may ask, how did this tradition get started? I'll tell you. I don't know. But so long as you know what you're supposed to do, you'll keep your balance. Now this is the sad, sad reality of every false religious system expressed by the beloved Tevye, father of five daughters, husband to one wife, bent on keeping tradition. And he has no idea where many of them come from, and therefore no idea about how to distinguish truth from tradition. I read about another story this week, and it was about a a young wife who um, early on in her marriage was cooking a ham dinner. And, um, And she just did what her mother had shown her and what her mother had always done, And that was to cut the ends of the ham off. And then she cooked the ham. And so just her mother had actually called her while she was cooking this ham. And she said to her mom, Mom, why do we cut the ham? Why do we cut the ends off of the ham? She's like, I don't know. My mother always did that. And so this young wife is thinking, well, I'm just doing what my mother always did. And So she decided, after she hung up the phone and the ham's still cooking, that she's going to call Grandma. She's going to go to the source and say, Grandma, why did you cut the ends of the ham off every time before you placed it into the pot and cooked it? She said, well, dear, I I cut the ends of the ham off because the pot I had to cook it in was too small and it needed to fit. You see, she was following a tradition... And she had no idea, really, of why she was doing what she was doing. She was just doing it because that's what had been handed down. 
Now, the Pharisees and Jesus are going to clash over religious traditions and how those traditions became more important, really, than God's Word. And we've already seen as we are walking through Mark's Gospel that Jesus does this with their tradition. He has no time whatsoever for their tradition. He has lots of time, though, for the authority of God's Word. And He wants us, and He wanted them, to see the difference between truth and tradition. And this is where we are. He rightly concluded, the Lord did, that it was not tradition keeping, but indeed this was the heart. That was the matter. The heart of the matter was the heart. And we need to all understand this. What matters to God is a heart that loves God, that loves people. See, this is the the law and the prophets. It's all summed up in this great commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love other people as yourself. That is the summation of it all. God wants a heart that loves Him and loves people, is humble, and is selfless. And in effect, Jesus continually asks, is it your tradition or is it the truth that matters the most? Let's begin with some context. I think we understand conceptually this whole idea of tradition, but let's just kind of uh, examine it a little bit more. The word tradition here comes from the Greek, it's paradosis, and it means giving over or handing down. And so you might ask yourself, well, what is being given over and what may be handed down? Well, it's it's, uh, a giving over or the handing down of oral and written practices, And these things are designed to help with keeping the law and therefore to be more holy. The Jewish system, Judaism, in its its form was was a legalism. It, it It was a matter of, it had become, not what God had given, but what it had become to the Jewish people was a a way of of trying to garner God's favor and and eventually to develop these traditions, these practices, in order to appear before God and people who are watching how holy you really are. Jesus is referring here specifically to traditions that have developed from those who claim to love God and who claim to love God's people. The traditions of the elders referred to in verses 3 and 5, this was extra biblical, listen, generational traditionalism, kind of like that young woman who was cooking the ham. It was handed down from generation to generation. The Pharisees and the scribes are applying their traditions to the people as the law. If you look at Galatians chapter 1, we actually have sort of a picture of the kinds of people who are approaching the Lord in this first verse, these Pharisees and the scribes, Galatians chapter 1, Paul is writing about it. He was one of these people. Verse 13, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Verse 14, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Paul realized after his conversion that he was keeping the traditions as if they were the law. And he knew that he was awry. Had been awry. Traditions are are typical. And in religion, perhaps none more evident than within the Catholic Church. Their views appear to be parallel to that of the Jews. Catholic tradition is placed on par with God's Word. This is from the Catholic Dictionary, page 41 to 42. Quote, it is an article of faith from a decree of the Vatican Council that tradition is a source of theological teaching distinct from Scripture and that it is infallible. It is therefore to be received with the same internal assent of Scripture for it is the Word of God. That is a sad, sad commentary 
And many people are deceived by that lie. From the Catholic Catechism for Adults, page 11, it says, you know a catechism starts with a question to try to teach doctrine. You start with a question and you provide the answer. And they're usually fast hitters. Question, do you have to believe in tradition? Answer, yes, because it is the Word of God and has equal authority with the Bible. Warren Wearsby said, quote, The Jews called tradition the fence of the law. It was not the law that protected the tradition, but the tradition that protected the law. That's why they called it the fence of the law. They said, basically, let's put a fence around the law so that people will stop at the fence before violating the law. And so what developed with this perhaps initially well-intentioned system was that generation after generation added their rituals, added their rules, added their prohibitions, added their commands, and after a while, that fence became so high that you couldn't see the law. The traditions made that fence so high that the law was almost unrecognizable. This week, I was reminded as I was studying out this passage of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. I read through it this week again a couple times. Here's basically a summation of that wonderful sermon. True holiness is a matter of inward affection and attitude, not just outward actions and appearances. Jesus taught that a person who obeys the law externally can still break the law in his heart. Because if it's the attitude that comes from the heart, then it's possible to obey. But if you have a rotten attitude, you're actually breaking the law because that's what we mean by worshiping in spirit and in truth. It speaks to genuineness and it speaks to authenticity. The problem with the tradition of man or the tradition of the elders is a warped view of sin and holiness. It became a struggle between man's tradition, and God's truth. And this really leads us to a statement that can capture the whole kit and caboodle today. So let's kind of narrow it all down to this very simple phrase. So kids, if you've got your kids' bulletins, you're going to want to pay attention here because I need, an, I need a fill in the blank. The blank of God is more important than the ideas of men. I've said it several times already. So let's fill in the blank. The. Okay, so let me ask you this question. <laughs> Got to become a, uh, a teacher again. <laughs> Thought that was going to wait until tomorrow. The Word of God would work, absolutely, because the Word of God is what? Well, I heard that. T- Somebody said truth. Somebody said truth. Fill that in. The Word of God is God's truth, everybody. God's Word is truth. The truth of God is more important than the ideas of men. Now listen, let me just pause here for a moment and say what we, what I believe we, most of us probably know to be true. And that is this. I am not here today to rail on tradition. Not my purpose. In fact, there are some traditions that are well to be kept. It's not necessarily tradition that's bad. I mean, all of us have traditions, don't we? I mean, as we approach the Thanksgiving holiday, we're going to execute some of those traditions, aren't we? And once we get past there, then we start to approach the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we're going to implement some of our traditions there. It's not necessarily the tradition that's bad. One of the traditions we have is to open up our Bible and we go to Luke chapter 2 before we do anything concerning gifts. Anything, we, we open up to Luke chapter 2 and the kids have for, I think you're 26 now. We go through and we start and we read uh, that account of the Lord's birth. That's a tradition. Nothing wrong with that. If I impose my tradition upon you and I make my tradition the law and I then conclude that you are not keeping my tradition of doing what we do as a family, 
because we feel it benefits us, and I make you out in my mind or with my words to be a sinner because you don't do what I do on Christmas Day, that's sin on my part. So tradition is not bad, but your application of it can be very bad. So I think we understand the concept of tradition. Give me a thumbs up if you do. Yay. And I think we understand this in its contextual use here. That was tradition defined. Tradition defined. Now let's consider tradition applied. Tradition applied. Because we want to see the danger in a misapplication of tradition. Look at verses 1 through 5. Let's start with, with uh, just this little premise. Following Christ is not about keeping a bunch of religious rituals. It's about a relationship with God. This is really a matter of the heart versus ritualism. It's a matter of the internal versus the external. It's a matter of faith versus works. Verse 1. Let's look at it. Verse 1, now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. Let's just stop right there. Understand this, point number one. Point number one under this tradition applied point, here's the first sub-point. That keeping traditions of men doesn't prove one's spiritual maturity. Keeping the traditions of men does not prove your spiritual maturity. Let's see where this comes from in the text. Verse 1, we see, now when the Pharisees gathered to him, this is a delegation, they are coming with an agenda. We are going to see from this point forward that Jesus is going to be dogged by delegations coming from almighty Jerusalem. And they are coming, all pious and high and mighty, and they are going to demand that Jesus execute tradition the way they do. And here's one example. Hand washing. Mark names the Pharisees and some of the scribes. Let's look over at Galatians chapter 2 for a moment, and I think you'll get an idea of who these people are. Galatians chapter 2. Paul was a later apostle, you know. He was, uh, he was fervent in his traditionalism, And he was persecuting the church until the Lord, post-resurrection, literally grabbed his heart and said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And and this is is the Lord grabbing Paul, ripping him out of that um, generational traditionalism, and, and Paul becomes a minister of the gospel because of the sovereign work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was dogged by his compatriots. And so Paul is is, uh, meeting with the other apostles. And it took a little while because they knew what Paul had done and who Paul was. And it took a little bit for them to accept him at first. And so listen to Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. You see, people were saying that Paul wasn't preaching the same gospel as the rest of the apostles. And he said, I am telling you, it's the same gospel. And so he says, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. He was very concerned about the authenticity of his message. And he was willing to submit to the other apostles. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Paul is saying here that there are traditionalists 
who are offering extra biblical matters, placing it on par with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not the truth. It's a creation of man, and they are trying to impose this on us and take away our freedom and make us slaves to that which Christ has already gone to the cross and been resurrected to free us from, which is called grace. And so this delegation of Jerusalem was like this, described by Paul in Galatians chapter 2. These people know the scripture. This is the difficulty. They know the scripture. They know its meaning. They read it. They memorize it. They discuss it. They talk about it. They protect it. And they misapply it. They go to the synagogue all the time. They observe religious holidays. They fast and they pray. They view themselves as the standard of holiness. This is religion externalized, not love internalized. Huge difference. And it did not prove their spiritual maturity. In fact, it revealed the error. Verse 2. Notice it says that they saw... (laughs) They noticed. They saw that they didn't wash. They saw that Jesus' disciples didn't wash their hands. You know what? That's exactly what legalists do. They make it their business to be in your business. They make it their business to see and observe and to take notice. They think their job is to point out everyone else's sin. Meanwhile, they fail to see their own sin. Brother and sister in Jesus Christ, it's very important that we look internally first before looking out externally to notice what we believe is the error in everyone else. I had a a wise sage say to me many years ago, Keith, dealing with one of the trials and difficulties and challenges in ministry, this wise old sage said, Keith, Keep your nose clean. What was Pastor Lee saying to me? He was telling me, he was telling me, listen, don't sin against the sinners. Keep your nose clean. Great advice. Keep your nose clean. Now, verses 3 and 4 is a parenthetical statement. Notice it in the text. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands. So they notice, we, the, your disciples don't wash their hands, parentheses. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. All of these, this was the, the traditions of the elders. This was extra biblical stuff. Listen, has absolutely nothing to do with personal hygiene. We all have moms, and those moms emphasize the importance. Now, did you wash your hands? Before coming to the table, did you wash your hands? That's about personal hygiene. And when we wash our hands before eating, we're we're doing it so that we don't dirty up the food and get sick. Because we know that bacteria can get into things and it can defile. It can make you sick. It can harm you. Whether it comes through the mouth, whether it comes through the eye in the form of goose poop, it, it can harm you. That happened to me. So we've got to wash. We've got to be clean. The Pharisees' hand washing had nothing whatsoever to do with hygiene because it was a a piece of their traditionalism. It was ceremonial. It was a tradition of the elders. And it was one of the many traditions that had been passed down from generation to generation. It was part of that carefully constructed fence that was getting so high. And they treated this tradition as equal to God's word and 
And, and sometimes they even made those traditions superior to God's word. And so they said, verse 5, why do your disciples not wash their hands according to the tradition of the elders? They didn't say according to what God's word says. They said according to the tradition of the elders. Why do your disciples not wash their hands? They were evaluating the disciples according to their age-old tradition, not God's word. And again, there's nothing wrong with having traditions personally or as a group of believers, but we cannot evaluate and judge other people by our religious traditions and then make a draw a conclusion about their, their spiritual maturity. Because, listen, keeping traditions of men does not prove spiritual maturity. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Jesus is going to repeat this word to the scribes, the masters of the law, and to the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. And he will call them hypocrites many times over, as his predecessor who cleared the pathway, John the Baptist. You brood of vipers, who warned you of the wrath to come? Jesus is using very, very strong language here, and he responds to them and their ridiculous question with a designation of hypocrisy. Now, you probably know that the word hypocrite here from the Greek was a theatrical term. It referred to a stage actor, because in that day there may be an actor who played several different parts, and so they had a mask, and that actor playing several different parts would put a mask on to play a different person. And so this word hypocrite came to describe someone who was really not who they really were. And so a hypocrite literally is a mask wearer. They present in one way, but the reality is, is that they are a very different way. This is hypocrisy. So in this context, the Pharisees said that they loved God, but their heart was really attached to their religious tradition, not to God. They loved their traditions more than they loved God. And that was the problem. They loved their customs. They loved their habits. They loved their routines more than God. They were hypocrites because they pretended to be something that they really were not. And they imposed that on the Jewish people. We need to distinguish truth from tradition to avoid this kind of hypocrisy. Verse 7, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now Jesus here, as he always did with his effective instruction, is quoting scripture. Notice that the scribes and the Pharisees didn't quote scripture. They referenced tradition. Why do you not obey the tradition of the elders? Jesus says, quoting Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, This people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Here's the third sub-point. Keeping traditions of men can lead to vain worship. Keeping the traditions of men can lead to vain worship. Worship. Vain worship. Here's what the word vain means. It means empty, useless, pointless, meaningless, worthless. Keeping the traditions of men where you value tradition over truth can lead to meaningless, worthless, empty, pointless worship. Hosea, the prophet Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God wants our heart. He does not want our sacrifice. God wants our heart. He does not want our duties. God wants our heart. He does not want our prideful service. God wants our heart. 
church, our heart. We can pile up all of the deeds that we want to, but if they are done with a wrong heart attitude, it's vain, empty, useless, worthless, meaningless. I'm afraid that in our American culture, we may have developed an art of worship in churches. There was a song, a worship song, written several years ago called The Heart of Worship, which speaks to trying to strip away everything and let's be genuine and authentic about it because this is kind of getting out of control is what I think the songwriter had in mind. And what we see in, in many evangelical churches, sadly, is the hyperemphasis upon music, and we see worship as an art form. It's what I'm calling the art of worship. Now, on the other side of that extreme, and that art of worship can come in the form of mood lighting. It can come in the form of fog at people's ankles. It could come in the, the form of hyper-emotionalism to try to drum up emotion from people, to try to energize the room. But then on the other side of the equation, we've got the other extreme, which is the, the, the ultra-liturgical side of things, to where the more liturgical and the more traditional we are, the more holy we are in God's sight, Heaven forbid we use a translation anything other than the authorized. And in, and in some people's eyes, using the ESV, which is a collection of var very valuable and, and useful translations of, of texts that is actually, mathematically speaking, more accurate than the old King James for, for some, we are wretched liberals because of our use of a different translation. That is a, a traditionalism. Some churches will offer multiple services to try to meet the needs, the felt needs of their people. And so you may have a traditional service versus a contemporary service, effectively dividing your congregation right down the middle. Listen, here's the, here's the concept that I'm trying to communicate as I step into donkey manure. What I'm trying to say is this, and I am not trying to be offensive. I am merely trying to point something out. The error of traditionalism that's not rooted in God's truth. The heart of the matter is the heart. Worship without the heart or the mind, where you're hyper-focused on things that are extra-biblical, is vain or hypocritical worship. I think we also need to be very careful to not do church. We don't do church. We are, believer in Jesus Christ, the church. You don't do church. We can attend services regularly. We can go to small group meetings. We can read our Bibles. We can memorize Scripture. We can observe the Lord's Supper. We can serve in the church. We can pray before we eat, even in public. But the question is, why? Why do we do these things? Is it to feel clean and righteous and good enough for God? That would be a wrong motive. We sang to start the worship service today, come as you are. We didn't sing stay as you are. Come as you are and leave differently. That's the message. Come as you are, allow God's word to convict you, not me. That's not my job. Some people have said to me, you really convicted me today, Pastor. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I mean for God's word to convict all of us, starting with me. And so really, we need, to, we need to be sure that 
our deeds have everything to do with a passionate love and relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if not, then that's vain worship. Keeping the traditions of men can lead to vain worship. I can remember as a uh, high schooler, I, I grew up north of Syracuse, and so the Syracuse Orangemen were, were the uh, university, it was 45, 40 minutes from my house, and so we used to go to the Carrier Dome. I, I, saw, um, I, I saw college basketball games there, I saw college lacrosse games there, I saw college football games there, and, um, and, and a friend of mine was, uh, his father was a season ticket holder, and, um, and he was also Catholic. And so that was my first journey into a Catholic church was, was compliments of that experience. And the reason they went was for the sake of getting in the Mass on that particular day if the game was on a, on a Saturday because they would hold Saturday night Mass before the Sunday Masses in the city of Syracuse. And so we would go, and I just did what they did. They, they went and they, they uh, approached and they did something towards the back. can't exactly remember what that was, but I remember, the, uh, I remember the pads and I kneeled down and I was kind of looking to see what they're doing. And, and then I go and I, I sit down and then there was a bunch of Latin being spoken and it didn't matter that I had three years of Latin in high school because I was just on the cusp of failing every single one of those three years. I couldn't understand what was being said. I didn't know what was being done. Uh, oh, yeah, before the kneeling down, it, it was, uh, so, what am I saying? I, I mean, there were traditions that I experienced that I, I had no idea, and I just got kind of sucked into it, and, and that's the way traditionalism goes, sometimes when you aren't even aware of why. Cindy and I, uh, for her 50th birthday, had a chance to, to uh, go down to Charleston this week, and we went to a... St. Mary's of the Annunciation Catholic Church. Uh, and, and we went to that church because I have ancestors from the 18th century who are buried, one that I know of that's buried in that cemetery. And, um, and so we were able to see, wish, because it's so faded that I had uh, pencil and paper and do a grave, grave rubbing, but nevertheless, this, uh, this girl of mine, an ancestor, Amelia DeLorme, um, had passed, gotten sick, and she was committed to a convent so that the Catholic Church could care for her, and she died when she was 11 years old. This is an aside, but evidently, the, according to what we read about it, it was an extremely hot day in Charleston, and she, they poured cold water over her head, and she died from some sort of a, a, a brain issue because of that. It's back in the 18th century, late 1700s. But here's my point. We decided to go into that church because it was open for you to, to go into. So we walked into that church. We signed our name on the, in, the, uh, in the book. And we walked down the, before we even started walking down the aisle, the traditionalism just screamed. Over here to the right is a giant wooden, I believe white oak, uh, um, like uh, enclosure where you could see what that was all about. That was where they went for confession. And, um, and this structure was so that people could come, according to the tradition of the Catholic Church, and confess their sins to the priest, who would be their arbiter and be their mediator between their sin and God. Then we, uh, we looked up and we saw ah, all of the murals on the ceiling. Beautiful building. Incredible portraying the error of that religious system. And then we, we could, uh, we, there was a place, they had a, a, a closed off wooden structure where you could drop in your, your, uh, your tithe, which by the way is expected, demanded, and punishable if you're, uh, if you're not in keeping with that. And then we walked down the aisle and we got to the front and there were these two large marble stones and they bury past priests inside the church. And on the one side, we have the reverend so-and-so. And then on the other side, the very reverend 
said that on his stone. The poor guy to the left. I wondered if I was going to walk over here and find the irreverent so-and-so. But these are the traditions that, and, and there are people who, who flock in and populate that Catholic church, which is steeped in error. And their religiosity is a pathway to hell. Such was the case with these Jewish people. John MacArthur really summed this up in this way. He says this, because remember, keeping the traditions of men can lead to vain worship. MacArthur says, God does not accept worship, even worship in his name, directed at him, done wrongly. It's a problem, a serious problem, to worship the wrong God. And it's equally a problem, a serious problem, to worship the right God in the wrong way. And the Jews had turned this into a highly sophisticated art form. We need to not be there. We need to evaluate ourselves. Finally, the last subpoint: Keeping the traditions of men can void God's word. Now wait a minute, Pastor Keith. I know that somewhere in his word it says, and the word of God shall not return void. Well, just bear with me for a moment. Jesus is going to illustrate his point. Verse 8, you leave the commandments of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Listen, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. So what's he saying here? The Old Testament clearly laid out the responsibility of children to honor their parents. When children are young and in their parents' household, they have a responsibility to obey mother and father. They are to obey their parents. But when they are older and no longer responsible to obey because they are autonomous, they still have the responsibility to honor their father and mother. That's a matter of respect. And that is an outflowing from the heart. So what was going on here? Well, verse 11 and 12 really express it. Uh, actually, you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin. Okay, what in the world is that? Well, in this practice, a son could say that his possessions or his savings were Corbin, meaning especially devoted to God. In essence, what he could say by the approval of the scribes and the Pharisees what he could say is to his parents, as they are older and they are in need of assistance, he could say, sorry, it's committed to God. I can't help you, Mom and Dad. My money's all tied up for God. In that way, they made the word of God void. They're using the word of God, and so they thought, but the traditions of men, to say to their mother and father, sorry, I can't help you therefore nullifying or making void or making of no effect the word of God by your tradition, Jesus says, verse 13. A son could completely disobey the command to honor your father and mother and do it while being ultra-religious. Jesus called this making the word of God of no effect or void because of your tradition. Listen, using the spiritual to benefit the material is cold and callous religion. It's heartless. It's loveless. It's meaningless, vain, and contradictory to God's word. That right there expresses the reality of what was going on in this religious system. And brother and sister in Jesus Christ, everyone who is here today, we have to be very careful to not slip into the same heartless, meaningless, vain, hypocritical worship that Jesus is calling 
the Jewish people out on here. So the question is, is it truth or religion? Verse 7, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. We need to be really, really careful to get this correct. Remember Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, And the Lord said, Because this people, Israel, draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, what he is saying is, their hearts are far from me. Their lips declare me, but I know their hearts are far from me. Here's what we don't want to hear as I close today. This is what I don't want to hear God say to me. I don't want to hear, and you substitute in your name. Substitute in your name as you do an honest self-reflection. I don't want to hear this. Keith attends church, but his heart is far from me. Keith reads his Bible, but his heart is far from me. Keith prays eloquently, but his heart is far from me. Keith contributes money, but his heart is far from me. Keith ministers the truth of the gospel, but his heart is far from me. Keith loves to sing, but his heart is far from me. Keith talks to others about Jesus, but his heart is far from me. It's possible to go through the action, go through the motions and do church and amass our good deeds and throw our shoulders out while we pat ourselves on the back. All the while with our heart being far from God. Is it truth? Or is it tradition? We need to distinguish the truth from tradition. Because it is the truth of God that is more important than the ideas of men. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this time that we've been able to gather around your word. And I thank you for the very clear instruction that really didn't even need my words, Father. It's just right there in the text and so clear to us. And I thank you for giving us your word that speaks truth and for your Holy Spirit who illumines the text for us that it's understandable. I just pray, Father, that that you would continue to teach us by your Holy Spirit and convict us by your Holy Spirit of perhaps where we are off and that we might confess and repent because you've promised that if we confess acknowledge, agree with you concerning our sin and repent and turn around and head in the other direction that you will forgive us and we thank you that forgiveness abounds. Father, I just pray that you would continually fill us with your Holy Spirit as we invite the Spirit's work in our hearts as we live lives that are authentically and genuinely submitted to you. We thank you for this time for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.